As Nick already mentioned, my name is Jesper. I'm Chief, Chief Security Officer for Palo Alto Networks, covering what we call EMEA North, or Northern Europe. Um, but that also means I get to travel here a bit as well to support the team here locally. So what is a Chief Security Officer for us? Well, it's multiple things, actually. It's a security advisory role, so I'm not tied into sales. So I can't sell you anything, so I'm not going to try to do that. But I am going to try to sell you my convictions and my beliefs. So we'll see how that falls into place. But if you do want to buy something, we have a stand out there. Right? So just gonna... <laughs> but yeah, uh, a bit of background around me. Before joining what I call the dark side, before joining a vendor, I was uh, three and a half years in, uh, in one of the most business units, brought in just after NotPetya, that some of you might remember, uh, running global cybersecurity program and strategy um, for uh, the most drilling organizations, so the one that operates oil rigs and marine vessels all across the globe. Fun challenges there in terms of transformation journeys and digital security, digital trust as well. Um, before that, I spent a bit over a couple of decades in the Danish defense and government working with national security um, from a software development back in the early, early 2000 when it wasn't sexy to do DevSecOps, so still trying to build that into uh, national security systems, and then all the way up to running cryptographic and communication security for the past 10 years I was there. Um, very interesting journey. Happy to share more on that later. But today... I'm not going to talk too much about Palo Alto Networks, but instead share a bit of insight that I get from working with some of the largest organizations in uh, the region. But just for those of you that don't know Palo Alto Networks, three technology platforms is what we deliver, as well as threat intelligence uh, and advisory services from Unit 42 that some of you might know. The three platforms are focused around network security, cloud security, and security operations. And that's it for me. I'm not going to dive further into that because that's not what we're here for. Instead, I'm going to give you a bit of background for those challenges that I'm going to talk to you about. The first of all, we all know that cybersecurity risks have expanded over time, right? Whether it's the ever-growing attack surface and we can all peer into what an attack surface means for us, whether it's you know, aggregated number of devices continues to grow, the number of data or the amount of data that we have that continues to grow. Um, and that suddenly peers into topic two here, data overload, right? Now we have a lot of data. What are we going to do with it? Do we even know how much data we have and where it is? And that becomes another challenge for us as well, right? Then, of course, the workforce, whatever we call it, hybrid workers, anywhere workforce, it's just a workforce today, isn't it? That's reality. It's, it has changed from what it used to be. Um, so has our, our use of our devices and data as well, by the way. Um, one of the fun things that I like to look at when I talk digital trust and digital security with the organizations I work with, I always use my teenage daughters as examples. The way they use devices is very much different than the way I do. When they go to work, one of them, she's 19 now, when she goes to work, she expects everything to be done from her mobile device. She wants access to everything from her mobile device because that's the only device that she carries with her at all times which of course makes her a valuable resource for the organization she works with because then she's always available, right? But it has definitely changed. For me, it's always a company laptop that I go to as my first device. So that expands the attack surface as well for organizations, right? Newer generations brings new, new ideas and new ways of working as well. Then of course the supply chain, third party disruption. I'm not gonna to dive too much into that. Everybody knows that's a pain today, right? Look at the news, it's everywhere. And then, of course, regulatory, regulatory compliance. Regulators are definitely ramping up, which is a good thing. The one piece of advice I have to most organizations, though, is please don't use that as a high bar. Don't use that as the target of your ambitions. Use it as a minimum baseline, because they are so far behind in so many areas still, right? So when you see a requirement for regulatory compliance, make that your baseline. This is the minimum that we're gonna have applied across our estate, and then you build on top of that where you need additional, right? That would be my recommendation. That also prepares you a bit for what comes in the future from the regulators as well, right? Enough said. We did a survey um, together with a, a third-party organization in Palo Alto Networks. We questioned 1,300 uh, executives 
in, in different organizations around the world. 500 of those in EMEA, there's a QR code. And by the way, we share the, the deck afterwards as well, so you all get uh, access to this. And we asked them about their top three cybersecurity challenges. The difficulty of data management came out. Um, security being left behind changes in the tech stack. Most people feel that pain. And then, of course, lack of skilled cyber professionals. And then when we looked at, you know, what type of threats are they concerned about? In EMEA, supply chain threats, as a, it's, it was already mentioned, right? Business email compromise is rising still, unfortunately. Um, and then DDoS attacks. If I then tie that into what are they searching for, these organizations? What are they trying to achieve, right? What are their digital ambitions? And say, well, our focus on business outcome is on revenue optimization and risk reduction. That's going to be priority one. Number two is customer excellence. That goes back to when new generations, they go out and they look for um, services they want to procure. Let's take financial services, for instance. Banking today, if it's not a well-functioning app on your mobile device, younger generations will not be a customer of that bank. Their loyalty depends on the quality of services that they get and the availability of those services, right? If it's a poor app, I not, kid you not, they will actually shift banks. They will move away, right? Whereas me, I'm the kind of guy that's stuck with the bank that I had since I was 15, right? So it's a very different way again. And then the, the final leg of this is the employee retention and productivity. What's interesting is if you take the CIO's digital initiatives and pair that aligned to it, to the business outcome that you want to achieve, there's a lot of cool stuff in here. Earlier on the panel, there was a bit of a, a buzzword conversation as well, right? Is digital trust sort of a buzzword? No, zero trust is definitely, that was mentioned very early. Um, operational resilience might be a bit of a buzz as well, right? What does that actually mean? And then, you know, hybrid work, connectivity, data analytics, all of those things tie into. Where I find it interesting is, if we then couple those CIO digital initiatives with the CISO projects, then it starts to look like this. Still from the survey, what does that mean for our CISO when you want to improve business intelligence, for instance? It means a lot of things around data security, application security, identity and access management now is a priority, right? Probably has been for a long time, but now it's on the strategic agenda as well. And we can take others as well. If we look at data analytics, it's again data security, but now it's also application security. And it just keeps growing from there. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. I'll come back to that. But first, I'm going to share the challenges with you. So the top five challenges I see organizations are faced with, <coughs> apart from managing what I've just shared with you, is everybody wants to achieve some sort of flow like this, to be able to deliver a consistent end-user experience and a secure end user experience, right? Connecting every user wherever they are to whatever they need to connect to, right? Whether it's data or services, whatever it might be. That's the ambition of most organizations today. I've put in a bit of the buzz in the middle, right? The principles of zero trust, right? The continuous trust verification and continuous security inspection, which is two cornerstones of applying zero trust. Because zero trust is now on the agenda of most organizations, even though they might not know what it means, actually and how big of a transformation it can become if you don't manage it properly in the beginning. And that leads me to the very first challenge. There, is, there seems to be a legacy organization mindset in most organizations still. It's depicted here by the old phone operators, right? You get one call in, okay, let's take that one call and we connect it to whatever destination they want to be connected to very similar to how organizations work with their IT, OT, whatever, technology projects. They take one project and they look at it, they define a challenge or a problem or use case in that project and then they solve that individual use case. Instead of looking at the broader picture and trying to figure out, okay, can we solve this aligned with a lot of other projects at the same time by going in a shared direction instead. That creates and contains the silos that most organizations recognize. One of the fun facts here, I put in unclear roles and responsibilities. When I started in Maersk, the first thing I asked was, who owns technology? 
18 months later, I had a nice piece of paper where I could see clear ownership of all technology. It's not that easy in many organizations, right? So defining clear ownership is just one thing that has to be done in most organizations. And still, I meet organizations that have it, don't have that defined yet. And the scattered ownership, of course, leads to challenges when we address the part about having single challenges solved by single projects, right? The second challenge here is, depicted by Moore, the exponentially growing attack surface. I'm not going to dive too much into that. I've already covered it. But the third one, then. There we go. Frankenstein model, right? When you have all of these different challenges solved by different components in your infrastructure, you might be able to build something that will walk and talk, will not be pretty, and will definitely not sing and dance. It's going to be that Frankenstein model in your technology landscape, right? The challenge from a cybersecurity perspective here is you might have a security policy. From the security policy, you derive certain security measures. From those cybersecurity measures, you have security controls you want to implement and you want to technologically enforce those and you want to report on it. You want to have as much automation in there as possible. How do you do that across a scattered landscape of different technologies in there? It's going to be a very fragmented, enforced set of controls. It's going to require a lot of hands on deck to manage that complexity. And then, of course, we can't do anything without talking about, I hear it's automation, right? It could have been AI instead, couldn't it? Let's not go too much into that today. Uh, <laughs> but automated adversaries is definitely out there. It is my strong belief that organizations that are not focused on automation first in their architectural principles, in how they do their cybersecurity, they're falling behind. Because the adversaries out there, they're definitely doing. Cyber criminals are investing huge amounts of money in automation. They're doing data discovery when you, they compromise your networks and your infrastructure. The first thing they do is data discovery. Who's accessing what? Where does most employee connect to? And what data do they want to extract from there? Where's the HR system? Where's the service uh, ticketing system? All those kind of things. They, they are hunting for treasure. So they don't have to exfiltrate 200 gigabytes of data, but they can settle for 20 if they want to get a ransom demand in there. They're automating a lot. And that was just one example of it. The fifth challenge, then, is what I call cybersecurity Darwinismus. This is where you have a business that evolves way faster than your ability to secure it. So when you're ramping up on your digital ambitions and you go to the board as a CISO or technology leader and you say, okay, we can meet those demands, but it requires significant investments in how we do the security behind it. And if they come back and say, well, it's not really a good business case for us. We have to deliver at speed. We have to have, you know, faster go to market, whatever it is. And you're an inhibitor. You're not delivering at the same pace of the business. That's going to be a huge challenge. Over time, the digital ambitions will just increase and your capability to protect it will just be flatlined. And that gap is going to be significant in a very short amount of time, right? And that's, again, back to why I think automation has to be part of the principal architecture you have. So if I take the slide before where we look at the digital initiatives from the CIO, whatever that might be, and tie that into CISO cybersecurity projects, this is where I'm challenged. I was challenged. The first incident I had in MERS came three months after joining. And I was looking at no less than 20 different consoles and interfaces together with the security operations team. And I was asking them, okay, so who's an expert on this? No hands raised. Okay, who's an expert on this? No hands raised. Okay, who are we going to call who's an expert on this? No hands raised. You know, they, they didn't know what to do with it. I said, okay, so what are we going to do with this incident? We manually correlated everything. I received emails with spreadsheets of log data. I received different timestamps from different places around the world where I was, okay, so now we have different data sets with different timestamps as well. How are we going to manually figure out what on earth is going on here? And that's because this was our reality. 
there were so many different tools in place for all of these different ambitions they've had growing over the, the years before that. And even when I was there, it was a huge challenge to address this. But when I came to the conclusion, and this is a good match for, for Musk at the time, I said, well, if we look at 12 to 15 point products per digital initiative, so that and mean that my business case is I need to make 12 to 15 investments per digital initiative or should we try and do something different? And I came up with a very similar phrase to this, and this is also the vision of Palo Alto Networks, right? That we, we think transformation has become imperative for today's organization. We have to do things differently. So these are the priorities, right? You can ask yourself, whether or not legacy mindset should reduce your toolbox for transformation or if you should challenge that legacy mindset. If you should reduce your attack surface, consolidate your toolbox and architect for automation so it enables you to secure that transformation. And this was part of my strategy. The very first element was asking a few questions. How would you like cybersecurity to enable your business to grow even faster. We start with challenging legacy <coughs> mindsets. So first of all, it's all about intelligent data and analytics. Right? If you want to support that transformation and you want to be good at cybersecurity, you have to focus on the proactive components of cybersecurity. Right? It cannot be reactive only. You can't sit on your hands and wait for something to happen. It never happens to us, it happens to someone else. Even in Musk, you would think after an incident like NotPetya that costs several hundreds of millions of dollars for the organization directly, several billions of dollars for a lot of other organizations. 2,000 organizations was impacted back in 2017, right? And by the way, I, I don't know if you know this, but the group Sandworm that was tied to, to the NotPetya incident, they're still very much active. NotPetya is now version 4 point something. So it's still being developed, it's still being used in the wild. They're still attacking large-scale organization. Recently, in October, they were targeting telco in Ukraine. Very much an active group, right? But even six months after the NotPetya incident, I had a challenge talking about cybersecurity with the CEO. And I asked him, well, what did we learn? And he said, well, it shouldn't happen again. Good. What are we doing to make sure it doesn't happen again? And he said, that's... What are you here for? Great. Not a challenge at all. I'll take care of that. It will never happen again. I said, what's my budget? Budget, you say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was interesting to have that conversation. I asked the CEO as well, so how much time do I get with you each month? And he said, let's make it 30 minutes. OK, quick math in my head, 30 minutes out of say, a busy CEO of an organization, that amounts to approximately 0.5% of his attention span. I said, okay, so you're investing 0.5% of your time in cybersecurity. Is that, you know, placing it on the, the bar of importance here of not having not pet here again? He was like, I don't like the way you phrase it, he said. No, 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 just saying. So that, there's many ways of having that conversation, right? I ended up transforming the culture as well. I built a digital security council. So I had the CFO, I had the CTO, I had the CIO, and the chief operating officer, the COO, as well, in that digital security council. I met with them once a month for an hour, once every quarter for three hours. This was for education, but it was also for knowledge sharing. What were they doing? What was I doing? How did I impact their functions and their um, areas of the organization and how did they impact me and my organization as well and that was a game changer for Musk. so anyway intelligent data analytics was the first target for the security operations team how do we bring in data and then focusing on automation first moving to the state of proactive security turning the security operators away from being the hoodie in the corner into being a business enabler, sitting with the project teams and figuring out, okay, how does this tie in with our principles? And to be honest, from Palo Alto Network side, this is exactly what we focus on as well. Right? If you look at this from a time perspective, most organizations spend a lot of time for their analysts 
on figuring out what's actually worth our time, what should we detect, investigate and respond to, and then they apply analytics on top of that to be able to report something, and then hopefully they do a bit of automation. We believe you should flip that triangle. You should spend a lot of time on automation first, then you apply the analytics, the machine learning on top of that, and then you do the detection and investigation response, right? Get the systems to work for you, not the other way around, because then, finally, you will have a bit of time for the analyst to work on it. And just to give you one pitch about consolidation, and then I'll be very quick in wrapping this up. Why do I believe consolidation should be a priority? Why was I so focused on that in, in Maersk as well? Well, I figured out that I had a target. I wanted to reach that target. That was part of my strategy. And then I talked to a lot of different vendors from cybersecurity. There are 3,600 different vendors in cybersecurity space today, right? So I talked with a lot of them and I figured out, okay, so they have different strategic directions for their products and they don't match my strategic directions. They're not heading in the same way I am. So there's a risk of me not hitting my target. And even if I did do that, and that's depicted in the middle, even if I get them all aligned and then we're moving in the same direction, I still had that jigsaw puzzle of integrations, which was a huge challenge for me. So consolidation for me became essential consolidate as much as I could, because that allowed me to work with a single vendor in reaching one target. That could be a common business case. So addressing these five operational challenges, if you want to challenge the legacy mindset, stop doing what you've been doing for 20 to 25 years. Apparently it's not working. I mean, I look in the news, right? It's not really working. We need to rethink how we do things and how we prepare for the future. There is a growing attack surface, like Miles said at the dinner last night, you know, whatever happens around the world, you can't really let that depict how you should feel about it, right? There are certain things that you will have to do. You have to baseline something. And then the fragmented controls. If you're as fed up as I am with all of those different control enforcement points that are scattered in your technology landscape, do something about it, right? That comes from consolidation as well. The automated threat actors is going to be out there for a long time, probably forever. How do you adapt to that? And then finally, the Darwinismus part of things, right? Don't let the digital ambitions create a gap between your ability to secure the business. Keep pace, and the only way you can do that is if you start implementing automation as a principle. There we go. Final statement, be bold, change with purpose, and embrace the technologies that enable you to secure the way forward. On that happy note, these are the objectives I see organizations have success with today. Putting this in a cybersecurity strategy, this is typically what you would see in an IT strategy or the organizational strategy. Put that into the cybersecurity strategy instead. Focus on how you enable all of the business functions, how you can support the business drivers, and how you can help deliver on those digital ambitions, that is a cybersecurity strategy today in a modern organization. Thank you.